Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to join in conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in our music world. Today, I have the great pleasure of, of having um, the great and, and the one and only Dennis Chambers joining us in, in conversation on shaping your journey. Dennis, thank you so much for joining me in this in this conversation today. Well, thank you, Aldo. Glad to be here. I, I wanted to, uh, to just, just before we get on to the, the, the topic of shaping your journey, and, and of course, we're all responsible to a certain degree for our lives and our journeys and where we, where we take this, uh, sometimes this, this God-given talent and what we do with it. But what was the beginning for you? What was that beginning spark? I know you, you started super early. I think you were born a drummer, right? I mean, I think you came out with sticks, or did they give them to you when you, when you arrived? No, nah, it wasn't anything like that. But uh, I, did start, I did start very young, and, and I remember the urge to play was, was, was very great. Um, meaning that, you know, when I, my mom was a, uh, was a singer back then, uh, she used to sing with Motown, but for a short amount of time. And um, she she hated Motown, actually, to tell you the truth, f from the story I got from her. And, you know, she told me some stories that uh, I can't repeat, you know, about mm -hmm. Motown. But anyway, um, she put a band back. She put a band together in Baltimore. Uh, she became somewhat like a local celebrity you know, in the area or in the neighborhood because, you know, because of her trip to Detroit and joining Motown. But she put a band together. <clears throat> um, they used to rehearse at my mom's apartment and also in my grandmother's backyard. And at that time, I think I, I wasn't even four yet, but, or four years old yet. Um, but I was very, I mean, just tremendously fascinated you know with the drummer um very so where i can still remember um him being in the living room in my mom's apartment or being in the backyard the drum kit was a gretsch kit it was a champagne sparkle kit uh it was a five piece no no it was a four piece four piece kit um it had the ride crash and a hi hat. And I just sit there, you know, watching him play, um, you know, forever. And then, you know, like when he was, well, I would get kind of bummed when, when the rehearsal was over. But the, every now and then, when he would leave the drum kit, you know, I would get, go behind the drum kit, put my hand on the foot pedal to see how that worked. You know, and and then put my foot on it. And, you know, try to play the the bass drum and stuff, and um, you know, trying to hit the snare drum, you know, with something because he never left the stick bag. You know, so I would like get coat hangers and stuff. You know, and try to <laughs> hit, hit his nice. drums. Nice. And something about those those round gold looking things, you know, which were symbols that looked like flying saucers to me. You know, you know, from a kid's eyes. But the sound of it, you know, it just drawed me right in. Um, my parents brought me a drum kit when I was four. Somewhere during the age of four, they brought me the drum kit. And, um, you know, I played it. I was practicing on it, you know, playing to records. I was always, you know, playing to records or trying to mimic the records, not knowing what I know now, which is, I knew now that, you know, I was learning from the greatest musicians, you know, around at that time, you know, trying to like, uh, trying to like um, match what I heard, you know, and matching what I'm hearing from the, you know, from what was on records and also from guys that was in my area right here in Baltimore. And I, we had uh, some phenomenal musicians that you probably never, never hear about. You know, one was uh, Ralph Fisher, uh, Bob Lawrence. Uh, Ruben Armstrong, uh, uh, some of the names I can remember, and these guys had a, a you know, serious effect on me, you know, as drummers. You know, um, in fact, they took me under their wing and 
showed me a lot of things about playing the drums, you know? Right, right. And they would all try to get me to read. And I never got that together, even though, <laughs> right, right to this day, I never got that together. But they don't, they would always try to get me to read. And in fact, they, they took me to a school here called Peabody at uh, one time. And I think the drummer there, the instructor there, got <laughs> kind of weird with me because I can outplay him at a you know very young age, you know. But I didn't go, you know, I just wanted to go and learn how to read music. But he took it as a threat, you know, about, you know, like this young guy who can outplay him. You know, so that never came, you know, I never wow. got wow. never got serious with that after that. But uh getting back to, you know, watching those guys and learning how to hold the stick and um, you know, going, you know, teach it uh Ru Ruben Armstrong would teach me how to do uh, would teach me about the rudiments. And um then uh from there, you know, going into playing in marching bands, you know, and stuff like that. But I'm jumping ahead. So at the age of four, going through that stuff, learning how to to play the records, uh, and my parents bought the drum kit, which was tore up from my, I think my neighborhood uh, friends <laughs> pulled the drum kit up, and I hid them under the bed so my parents didn't find it because I knew they were going to trash me if they found it, tore up. But it was one of those metal round kits, you know, with the snare drum over here and the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. over there and a oh. crash in the middle. It's one of those things. Um, but they saw that. I mean, they, they saw I was getting, you know, I was like really depressed when that kid got tore up and they found the kid under the bed and, you know, they tortured me for a long period of time from that there. I mean, cause I didn't get a real drum kit till like I was, uh, what the, I think it was on my fifth birthday. That's when they bought a real drum kit and it was custom built. It was a store here called Ted's music, uh, yeah. downtown here in Baltimore. They brought the kit. Um, they took a floor tom and converted it into a bass drum. You know, because I was five years old, I yeah, couldn't yeah, play a real kit. And they didn't have toy drum. I mean, they didn't have real toy drum kits or real small drum kits then, like they do now. Right. So they made one. They had one made. Um, and I played that drum uh, or that drum set for a long while. I joined a band. Uh, at the age of six, right? Wow. So it's like a year later. I joined a band, um, started playing a nightclub that, at the age of six. Uh, I think it was a group called the Fingertips or something like that. And at that time, it was like, you know, like, like um, you know, soul music, like right. Sam and Dave, you know, Knock on Wood, all that kind of stuff. Um, but constantly you know, listening to other music, you know, at, at mom's house, which was listening to jazz and, and, um, you know, f uh, soul music, or, uh, funk music, um, some rock music, you know, and I thought in order to become a, a, a drummer, you have to learn all these styles of music because that's all I heard around my, around my mom's house at the time. Right. So, you know, I went into it, you know, with a very open mind and, uh, to listen to all these styles of music, at least to try to understand it. But jazz didn't it didn't take for me for a long while because man, that's a lot of that's a lot of um, you know, a lot of things going on, you know, at the time. You know, with okay, with with commercial music, you know, you play a part. Right. You know, you learn the part. And, or you play the groove and you stick to the groove and you, you know, play it from the top to the end, except for there may be some accents here or there. But with jazz music, it's improvisations. So I didn't know anything about like, you know, like playing from my heart, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, when you play jazz, it's, it's, it's totally like playing from your heart, playing what you feel and hear, responding, calling response to what's going on on the stage at the time or in the studio at the time. You know, so that was like beyond that was like way beyond me. So I got a chance to see Tony Williams uh, with Miles Davis right after uh, they recorded Miles Smiles. How old? How old was he then? I think I was eight. No, you were eight. But how about Tony? How, how old was Tony at that time? I don't know. Maybe 18. Yeah, maybe. 
Maybe 18, right? Well, he yeah. had to be 18, 18 or, or, or 17. I forgot what how old he was when he joined that band. I have to look back and see. But um But you got yeah, into the clubs the really Baker. early. I mean, you were you were allowed to go into the clubs at four years old, five, eight? No, six. Six. I was like, well, oh. I wasn't even no, I wasn't supposed to be going in there. But at that time, uh, the clubs I was playing in, uh, one particular was a place called Peyton Place. And all the clubs was on Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Avenue here in Baltimore. And that was the area or that was the street where all the entertainment, you know, would happen. Like the Royal Theater, we had that here. And, you know, we had all the greats play, you know, uh, in these on Pennsylvania Avenue. And Mr. Baker's club, uh, Peyton Place, was on Pennsylvania Avenue. So I remember seeing Tony at this place. I mean, Mr. Baker was like telling me, Shorty, you know, you need to, you know, if you're going to seriously play, if you're going to be serious about playing drums, you need to come back and watch this guy play. Wow. And I'm like, yeah, okay, Mr. Baker, whatever, you know. And then uh, uh, I talked to my mom, you know, about me going to this place to see. Or I was invited to see this this great drummer with this great band play. Man, when I went in there and uh, sat there, I remember Tony had this this white satin Gretsch kit, white satin Gretsch kit, and it sounded like when he came on the bandstand, it sounded like it was Tony Williams' band featuring Miles Davis. That's what it sounded like to me, <laughs> and. The stuff was like, all, all the music was like way over my head. I didn't understand any of it then, but I knew I was seeing something great. You know, where I'm watching this this technician drummer who's like, I mean, he swung the band just with the ride cymbal. You know, and, and, and kept time, you know, four on the floor on the hi-hat. And watching his left foot, like, it looked like it was flopping on the floor, you know. Going back and forth, you know, across, you know, across each end of the the uh, the heel of the of the hi hat. Right, right. That was all new to me. You know, I never saw, I never heard anything like it. But the idea of like he didn't play much until he was until it was time for him to take a solo. Then you know you hear this explosion back there. But every now and then he would drop these bombs, you know, like to to let you know he's there. But he didn't get in the way of the horns because he was, you know, all the, the whole um, vibe is like just swinging the band with a rod cymbal. And it sounded like the left hand, uh, I'm sorry, the right hand, left hand, and hi-hat had three different zip codes. <laughs> That's a good way to say it. Yeah, that reminds me. Yeah, no, no, that, you made me remember... Uh, when I was studying, I was a rock drummer and I suddenly got interested in classical and I wanted to learn jazz, but I, you know, I had no idea. But I was, I was studying with uh, this timpanist in, in, I grew up in Ottawa. He was a timpanist for the National Arts Center Orchestra. He, he was great. He played drums too, but he was like one of the great timpanists. When I started with him, he knew I didn't come from the classical background. He knew where I was going and what I wanted to do. So one day he comes in and, and hands me an album and it's Tony Williams, The Lifetime, you know, the black cover. Yeah. I had, I was totally no idea. So he says, tell me what you think. So I went home and I said, I, of course, I didn't understand anything. And I went back and he said, what did you think? He said, wow. I said, that, that's amazing, all those overdubs. <laughs> that, that was beautiful. He says, no, no, that, that's all live. That's totally, <laughs> then totally stumped me because... You know that album. Well, I mean, I've never seen Tony live, but I saw a lot of recordings. But when right. I heard that album, I had no idea who he was. Right. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But my my mind, when he said that, like my brain just couldn't couldn't understand understand like how is that possible? Yeah. Well, to Maybe. see him play and and to see how you know he just, he was sitting there very very comfortable comfortably and very still. And and he he always like looked at the rod symbol. He was like watching the rod symbol, like like he's having a conversation with the rod, you know. And uh, you know, he never showed any frustrations or any stress in his in his face. But meanwhile, the right hand man was the, it was just moving. Yeah, 
I mean, you know, like these, the, the you know, the dot eight, dotted eights, and the five. Sometimes you play like these five or six beats on the on the rhyme symbol at a very fast tempo. And I mean, it just blew me away. I uh, I remember I couldn't sleep for forty eight hours. I'm not kidding, and it, it's very seldom I run into people that make me feel that way or have that effect on me. Billy Cobham was a, was another guy, right? Jack D. Jeanette was another. You know, Elvin Jones was another. Um, but you know, let's face it. You know, just those names alone. You know, uh, they. I mean, they were the guys. You know, amongst you know now the other guys is Art Blakey, which I played opposite of him when I was thirteen or fourteen or something like that. And he summoned me to his dressing room, and um. You know, he wanted me to come to New York. He wanted to, you know, help, you know, get me out there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But my mom would let me go. Actually, Walter Davis was in that band, the piano player. Walter Davis was in the band, and he was trying to get me to come to New York and play it on a record of his. Wanted me to play uh, uh, side B. Side A was Tony Williams on that record. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I got a chance to, you know, after meet, meeting Art Blakey, I got a chance to, you know, meet, you know, you know, other people like Buddy Rich, and uh, and I met Tony uh, Williams by by chance. He was coming down from um, New York. To, he was going to Washington, and he stopped at Art Blakey's hotel to pick up some things, which I'm not going to name. <laughs> You know, I'm sitting there talking to Art before Tony comes in, and I'm t asking about Tony Williams, you know, like forgetting or didn't know, actually, that he knew Tony Williams. And I'm like, man, you ever heard of this guy, Tony? I didn't say man, but, you know, Mr. <laughs> Blakey, have you, do you know Tony Williams? You ever heard of him? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, shorty. And I'm like, man, this guy's the greatest. And all of a sudden, there was a knock on the door about it. About, I think it was an hour later. Mrs. Blakey. Or was some lady that answered the door uh, that was with Art. I heard her say, oh, yeah, yeah, he's here. Come on in. And then Tony Williams walked in the room. And I'm looking at Art. I'm looking at Tony. I'm looking at Art. <laughs> looking at Tony. And I didn't, you know, you know, uh, Art was like, oh, yeah, Tony, meet meet Shorty. I mean, uh, Dennis. Uh, with, uh, meet Dennis Chambers. He He's a big fan of yours. And I'm just looking at him. And I shook his hand and it was like looking at God, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that that's how I met him. And then after that, you know, we we became some, you know, well, we became friends, but we became good friends uh, in the later years. After you know, my name got out there, and he started seeing me. Uh, or he, I played opposite of him a few times, and. Uh, in fact, I was on the last clinic he did uh, at Thoroughbred Music in Florida. I got video footage of that, man. That was brutal. That was really, really killing. Uh, and then you but, were... But, you know, like um, going back again, you know, like, you know, learning from, you know, like uh, James Brown's drummers, by records, that is. James Brown's drummers and then uh, the Stax recording, I think it's Al Jackson on drums, listening to that stuff, learning how to, you know, to, you know, perfect time, good time and a good groove and a, a solid feel, you know, and really not knowing that that's what I was doing. I, I, I just figured that's how you learn how to play. Right. But that now that I look back on it, you know, um, that helped me to, to become a drummer with some decent feel. Yeah, and it also taught me that you know, um, no matter what I do, try to approach it from a musical standpoint. Yeah, no, you made you made a, a really good point, and and I'm seeing this in in a lot of my conversations, and and I'm a strong believer in in in, in that because that was my experience. You play first, you play the records, and then somewhere along the line, you you learn the the art of reading and you know all of that, and you get yeah. the training. I mean, in your case, I mean, you're probably so far ahead that it just didn't matter anymore. But to most people, uh, that's a great way to start. I mean, to learn what everybody has done. Not yeah. just from hearing about it, but actually playing those records and learning what they did. Right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, because, you know, as, as you can remember back then, 
um, you know, on a lot of soul music, you didn't know who the musicians were. Like you look at the Motown, for instance, you look at those those early recordings um, of that stuff. You know, you wanted to find out who the musicians were. You didn't know. Yeah. All you know, you just heard some music. And then later on, you know, like the, uh, I think it was like the last, within the 15, 20 years, then you learned that Motown, those musicians were uh, on all those records. It was just one band. Right. That played on all that stuff until Motown moved to California. Right. And they, they had another set of musicians out there. But during the earlier years, you know, like the Four Tops, the Temptations, the Supremes, the uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, even the Jacksons, you know, the, that was one band that recorded on all that stuff. But yet they didn't sound the same. Right. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. And so then you were, you were at this point, you were 13 or something and, and, and playing the clubs and then playing with different people. Then you, then you started, you got into Parliament, right? Funkadelic? Yeah, but before then, I was, I, I uh, in junior high school, I had a union card. So that allowed me to play in a lot of places, you know, like the union buildings. So, right. you know, sometimes the groups would come by or come through and they would pick up a band to play. Um, so in uh, junior high school, I was able to play with people like uh, Teddy Pendergrass or, I'm sorry, I was able to play with uh, Harold, Mel Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes, and Teddy was in the band. Okay. Um, Eddie Kendricks, David Ruffin, the Spinners, and stuff like that. Um, which kind of made me uh, made me a, a local celebrity in the school because, you know, sometimes uh, you know, I, if I had played a gig the night before I was supposed to go to school, I didn't go in the next day because I had stayed out so late that I, I couldn't get up in the morning. Right. So, right. but when I got there, you know, when I finally went to school that the, the next following day after that, um, some kids would ask, you know, cause their parents had said they saw some kid playing a, a drum kit. And um, when he was introduced, they said he was from this area from Baltimore and they wanted to find out, if, if it was me or not, because they noticed that I wasn't there, you know, the day after that show, <laughs> you know, dead giveaway. Yeah. Right. Was there a, a school band program at the school? Yeah. Did you play in the band? Yeah, I did. You know, that's another thing, uh, you know, I, I, I wish they would bring back, you know, cause they took a lot of the, the music programs out of these schools, Yep. you know, and that's why a lot of the, a lot of kids, you know, they don't know anything about an instrument. They know about, you know, well, I mean, the guys that rap, you know, they just know a turntable and scratching or a drum machine, you know, and or or, or a synthesizer or, you know, where they can actually play the, you know, play the instruments off of a keyboard, you know, but they don't know, you know, how to physically play an instrument. The rappers, you know. Right, right. Got, yeah. And then yet they, you know, when they go out and um, try to write a piece of music, what they do is sample something that was already there, which is going to get them in trouble when they publish it because they didn't really write it. Right. You know, they didn't really write it. They just, they just lifted it. And I hate to use the word steal, but, you know, basically that's what they did, you know, and you know, if you notice like today's music, you know, you turn on the radio station, you always hear hints and hints and pieces of stuff that was already done, you know, like 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then when you try to, for me, it's like when I try to talk to some, some guys now that I'm 60 something years old, now I'm old school. Yes. <laughs> you know? Well, we could say, you know, back I, and I remember growing up, I mean, in the 60s, uh, Dennis, it was like that. Like everything you heard was different yeah. from the next. And every day, I mean, there was a period where I went to concerts as I, in, when I was a teenager, in a period of three, four years, I think, when I was, before I left Ottawa, I saw every single concert that came to town, no matter what it was, just because I, I was just so curious. And, and every one you saw would be totally different from the next yeah. one. And that was exciting, you know, and then yeah. you're playing in a band and then somebody would say, hey, uh, I just heard this record. It's Jimi Hendrix. And you say, oh, my God, what's that? Where did that come from? 
you know, then yes. And then, you know, all kinds of different things and coming in for, from everywhere. I don't think they yeah, have you know, that quite these days. I mean, maybe. Yeah, you know, not. it's crazy. I mean, what happened, as far as I know, uh, as far as I can remember, um, you know, uh, when I first got it, well, when I first got into playing music, um, you know, we had one radio station. Actually, I'm sorry. A, a music was, it was on AM stations. It wasn't FM. FM was just white noise at that time. Right. And um, on AM stations, there was a few radio stations, but, you know, they had the black stations and the white stations. And, um, you know, thanks to the ignorance of colors, uh, color of skin, um, a lot of history is still unclear or it's not told right. <laughs> right. No, um, you know, when you, when you start talking about the history of rock and roll and you don't talk about somebody like Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, <laughs> you know, I mean, yet, you know, I remember, you know, seeing on, uh, watching the Grammys and, and they had Little Richard presenting award to an artist whoever won in the rock category. And then he says, uh, the winner is me. And then people started laughing and stuff. And then he got serious, you know, and we were taught, you know, you know, with little Richard, we were taught to laugh at him. You know, he's just, you know, like a very odd bird and all that stuff. But when you sit and listen to him, especially that day, he said, you know, like, I don't know why I'm out here. They, they hire me to present on, on an award that of uh, some music that I started. Yeah. He said, they never gave him a Grammy. And then I, you know, sitting there laughing, you know, laughing about it. But when I researched it, how come this guy never got a Grammy? How come they didn't give him one? Yeah. And, yeah. and then you go back and you listen to, uh, <clears throat> you know, the history of music, you know, from a video, I had this video called, uh, it was either the history of music or the history of rock music, but I think it was called the history of music. And in the video, it, it's it's like uh, what's so unique about this video? The video was was it was stories told by the artists themselves. Okay. So you know it went through all these different styles of music, and then they went into um, rock music, and then they went into the British invasion, mm. and everybody that was in the British invasion, they admitted that they stole from, you know, stuff that was here already, like sure. Little Richard. Everybody was talking about Little Richard. Oh, sure. It was either I, Little Richard, Fats, Dominoes, or Motown. Yeah. And you remember, uh, I mean, I saw a couple of documentaries where, I mean, the guys in the Stones, I mean, Mick Jagger himself, and, and Keith Richards, actually, in bits it says, no, we were learning from all those guys, and yeah. we were copying their records. Yeah. And we went to Chicago to meet them and, and pay, pay homage. But before we knew it, we're the superstars, but we're yeah. copying them. <laughs> and he, you know, he clearly admits it. And now we we see that we know that because now but we yeah, understand. But yeah, but yeah, we know and we see it. But you know, back then, I remember. Yeah, I I don't know if you saw the piece where it, the the Beatles was just about to go uh, get on a plane and come to America for the first time, and the uh, interviewer asked them, "It's like when you step foot on American soil, what's the first thing you want to do?" And they were like, well, you know, we want to go see, you know, we want to meet Fats Domino. We want to meet Little Richard. We want to meet all these artists. And and they also talked about, uh, if I remember correctly, they said they wanted to meet Muhammad Ali. And the last thing on the list was they wanted to, they wanted to go to Graceland. Yes. Well, in the States, as I remembered, the only thing you heard was, you know, when the Beatles come, you know, the first thing they want to do is go to Graceland. That's all you heard. Oh, I, that part I missed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. They just wanted to go. And in and, and the Beatles, uh, uh, on that videotape that I saw, uh, the uh, I think it was uh, Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney and George. No, John. John. Paul, Paul and John was talking, and they were, you know, they were wondering why, or they were questioning, questioning how come the story wasn't told that, you know, told truthfully what they wanted to do. And sure. that's when they learned about prejudice in America when they came here. Sure, sure. 
And I, I, I know for a fact that they had, I mean, there were a lot of discussions, even with the record companies, be between England and here when they're uh, deciding these strategies, that they're leaving a lot of stuff out or, or, or changing things around. And they're saying, wait, we're, we're the copycats. We're, this should be first. They should be, uh, yeah. you know, we shouldn't be headlining like that. Yeah. But I mean, of course, they weren't in control of that. They just, they were like all of us, they're musicians and we're, we're just playing and, and the business side is taking care of other yeah. people. But it, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Um, but I'm glad people are talking about it because it's, 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 a long, it's a long history. And, you know, one doesn't really want to get, you know, heavy into that. But I think we should understand, you know, that that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, people should understand and people should know the true history, you know, about rock music, about about music, or about history, period. You know, yep. all history. I mean, just history. Study, you know, history. Um, I mean, because we've been bamboozled. <laughs> we've been seriously bamboozled. Um, especially as a race, of, you know, my race has been bamboozled, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good word, but I mean, you I, know, think I, you know, I, and, 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 and I don't, I really don't want to go into deep with this, but you know, when you travel, when you step outside of your own country and you go to other countries, you start seeing things, yeah. you know, like when you go to, you know, Greece uh, or Turkey or, or Istanbul, uh, you start looking at religion and, and, and I really don't want to get deep into this, but you start seeing, you know, like all the all the artifacts of religions. It's like Jesus Christ is portrayed as a black man. And then you go. I went to the Vatican. If you go, if you go to the, if you can make it to the back of the, the Vatican, they got all these old ancient artifacts, and they show Jesus as a black man. And even in the ancient Bible, it says G Jesus was a dark man, dark man with woolly hair, or dark dark skinned man with woolly hair. But yet in America, we were taught to, you know, you know, look at this guy as, you know, like this guy's white with long hair. And you know, yet you go over to these countries, you go to Israel and um all the places where Jesus had roamed or had been, supposedly. And first of all, it's like back in them days, they didn't have any air conditioning. And you didn't want to be inside of a house because the house back in them days was like an oven. <laughs> yes. So anybody that was in that area, they were going to be dark. But yeah, but anyway, like I said, yeah, I yeah, want to yeah. deepen that. But, but just, that just to finish, just to finish that, it's interesting because if you go to Italy specifically, there's a Black Madonna in Sicily in, yeah. in one of those churches. So I mean, that, that's that's a big question. But I think what what's really important for us is to understand that sometimes things were channeled, you know, channeled information or misinformation. And it's gone back, you know, on all levels. I mean, we can go on and on about music, yeah. about people, about, uh, I mean, I, I was born in Italy and yeah. you know, I, I was nine years old when we came over here. And, you know, understanding the big picture, I think is super important. And I think everyone should take it upon themselves to to, to make up their own minds and to see clearly. Because, yeah. you you know, what, what you do affects the world. And then if you do something of significance, you could you could be... It could be a, a, a good power and a power of good, but to yeah. yourself, you know, you don't yeah. have to be taking over the world, but just be yeah. where you are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. To be totally clear. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, and, and the funny thing is this, Dennis, and I always say this, you know, we are part of a different nation. We, we speak music. So imagine having all of us who speak music with a passport that we belong to this nation. Yeah. And it's and that nation covers the whole world. Yeah. It's a it's a religion, it's a it's a language, it's a and and we are musicians. That's is the music land. Yeah, ambassadors. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. and we can go around the world and we all understand each other. Yep. I mean, you can go in and I'm sure you have as I have uh, you go anywhere on the planet, you sit with musicians, you don't say a word but you play and it and it works. Yep. And everybody understands. Yeah. Can't talk, but you can understand, you know, that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. huge. This is huge. I mean, we are so 
lucky to be able to do this. <laughs> it's amazing, actually. Yeah. Anyway, let's move, moving on to like the some of the other things that you were involved in musically. I mean, you're you had a really early start. So by the time you're 13 and 14, you're playing with some really serious people and developing some really um, uh, headway musically. You know, I was speaking of uh, Parliament uh, Funkadelic earlier, but yeah. what were some of the other bands that, that you were with at the time? Oh, uh, before I joined Parliament, uh, I was playing in jazz clubs, so I was able to play or got a chance to play with a lot of organ, jazz organ players, uh, 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 Jack McDuff. Um, wow, okay. Um, Charles Erling. Uh, <sighs> Ah, Jack McDuff, Charles Erling. What's the other guy? De Francesco, Joey? No, 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 no. I'm talking about old. They, they're old. They, they're gone now. Oh, yeah, well, Joey's gone too. But yeah. no, I mean these were like Joey's heroes. I was playing with Joey's heroes. Um, I can't think of the, the, some of these organ players because it, it was a long time ago. But they were led. They were legend organ players. Right. And I was playing with them. But also, when I started playing at this this club called the closet and the closet jazz closet was owned by Henry Baker. Again, the guy who was uh, used to own the Peyton place where I saw Tony. Okay. So he had another club and I played in that. So I was, you know, they were playing with, you know, Freddie Hubbard, and um, Woody Shaw, Gary Bartz, um, Sonny Stitt. Wow. You know, and this was all before Funkadelic. So when I joined Funkadelic, Actually, uh, Rodney Ski Curtis brought me in. Uh, Rodney Ski Curtis is a, a, a friend of mine who's like a brother to me. And we used to play in a band called Uncle Remus. He left Baltimore and joined Funkadelic first. Um, and then um, through, I think, through three years or four years, three years of him being there, maybe two years of him being there, he was trying to get me in, you know, through the back door of this thing. Uh, but every time the, the chair had opened, the chair was filled again, you know. So then there was this offshoot band that came up, which was called the Brides of Funkenstein. And um, he got me in that band. And then, it, you know, like less than a year, I think I was playing with Funkadelic, at, you know, when the chair opened up again. George uh, Skeet would like come on the side of the stage, watch me play with the Brides. Sometimes he would bring some of the other band members to come up to see. He was like, you know, like he was just a proud brother, you know, like trying to get them to watch me play. And then George saw me play. And then he had, you know, they got me to set in with, with Funkadelic. And then next thing I know, they, all the drummers were fired or let go or whatever have you. And I'm like this young kid just playing the whole show, which was like three, sometimes four hours wow. of playing, you know. But you know, I was I was young, full of full of energy. You could not pay me to do that now. <laughs> well, you know? that, I mean, that was a lot. I mean, I, I don't think we even saw it. I mean, any of us who were involved at the time, all this playing. I mean, day and night, we didn't see it, right? And I'm sure you were the same. At yeah. that age, you're just hungry for this, and it was just fun, right? Yeah, was, yeah. But you know, when I joined Santana later, that was close to it. I mean, that was like. Two and a half hours, sometimes you know, three hours, almost shows, you know. And when you're when you're in it, you know, when you when you're in it, you're playing, you know. Sometimes you're so in it, man, you don't even realize the time it went, or you know, the pain that you could be in, or you know, like I've saw, you know, playing with John McLaughlin. I remember uh, he had threw all the muscles in his back out once. Uh, we were in uh, in Japan recording the live rec the live record. Uh, with Joey, and uh, the first night we played, that's when he threw us threw all the muscles out. The second night he didn't play at all. The third night he came in with a body brace on, and that was the night they. That's the night that you heard on record it was the third night. And this guy, when he walked in, he was in pain. But when he got up on stage and put that guitar in his hands, he was bending, you know, moving, and I'm. I'm playing, but I'm watching him, you know, like really afraid that he was going to fall over or, or, you know, or something. So I wasn't really into the show, 
you know, I was really into watching him, making sure he was okay, you know, but, you know, and I asked him when we came off, like, man, where are you, where are you in pain? He says, no, man, I wasn't in no pain at all. Yeah. But he said, but I, you know, now that you mention it, ow, ow. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a funny thing, Dennis, and I, and I think you have the same experience, because I realized the one point that when you're playing, and, you know, I certainly played a lot, and, and I remember once I was sick on a tour, like really, really sick. I mean, it was nonstop. I was sick. We arrived. All the tech guys went to set up. I went directly to uh, to see a doctor. I, I was in such pain. I was just in really bad. Middle of winter, you know, the whole nine nights. I'm sitting there and uh, in pain. I said, I have a concert tonight. And can, can you do something? Because we can't cancel. And, and, he's, and he was looking at me. He says... I have tickets to that concert, so we better make you well. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he gave me some, some things to take. I, I went in from the stage, I, and I remember this clearly because that's when I realized the power of, mu of music, right? Yeah. I was in such pain. I was, like, dying. The moment I sat on stage, the moment I had sticks in hand in the malice because, you know, we're repercussion my group. We played a two-hour show. The moment I got off stage, I collapsed. Yeah. And they took they they literally took me to my hotel and they went, you know, partying or whatever, whatever they did. And I just was frozen until the next day. So I realized, like when you're when you're playing, I didn't feel a thing, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's amazing, you know, the 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 power of, of music in general. Yeah, I remember having like uh I think I needed a uh a wisdom tooth pulled or something, and I was on tour with P Funk. You know, I'm in the dressing room, you know, like holding my jaw, man, like trying to figure out how I'm gonna make make it through this night. <laughs> and um, I went on stage. I remember, you know, like in pain. They they giving me all they giving me all kind of painkillers to to kill the pain, but none of it was working. Um. But yet when when it was time to count off, I think it was like the second song in, I felt no pain. Beautiful. In fact, I forgot that I had a toothache, you know? Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah. But, you know, after the show was over, you know, I say about an hour later, here come the pain. But, you know, John McLaughlin always, John McLaughlin would always say to me, it's like, man, there are nights where you're playing for the gods. And, you know, you get into the moment you know, of playing or going through through the motions of doing it. And like Tom just sits still because you're having so much fun. And, you know, especially if you're improvising, you know, just playing off the cuff, off the cuff of your your your, your head. Um, you know, things just happen. I remember playing gigs with him and I'm trying to mess up and 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 you know like thinking of like if I put in if I'm gonna start this drum fill I'm going to move like a 16 beat over and try to come down, you know, where I come down, I'm going to try to make it, you know, where the one is, where his one is, but I'm moving 16 beat over, you know, and then I start this drum fill thinking that, you know, oh man, in the middle of it, I'm thinking it's not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> and then I come up with something, bam, I'm right on one. And then I look back at the, the other drummers that are behind me or the musicians that are behind me. And I just shrugged my shoulders like, I can't even mess up. <laughs> and I'm trying to. I'm trying to throw it off, but I can't I can't do it. Interesting. Very interesting, man. But, you know, with John, I, I, some of the tempos were so fast in some of those songs where, you know, like other nights where sometimes he have, he'll struggle through some songs. And then other night, uh, the, the rest of the, of the tour, I mean, he's flying through this stuff. Fingers are just moving all kind of which ways. He's trying to make those notes in that short amount of time. And we're, we're, I mean, we're like at Mark 12, you know, in some of those tempos, you know, it's crazy. I look back or I listen to some of those tapes now in order for me to play like that, I have to, I have to go back in the basement and, and spend about a month trying to practice those tempos. I couldn't play those tempos now. Right. It's probably a, a, a different maturity. I mean, the, the physical aspect, I mean, you were put, I mean, at, at that time, I've, in those days, and I've seen you play some of those, some of those things. 
and we all look at each other and we say, really? I mean, it's, it's when we're young, our physical, uh, physicality allows us certain things and you're elastic because you're playing like all the time. And then yeah. there's there's a time where it's less quantity but more quality, but at a different maturity. And I think I think it's important to be there too, right? Yeah. The, yeah. I was just curious. Also, the, also being able to play or, or being in a position uh, to be in a band or being a, in a situation where you can do that. Right. Was, That's yeah. another thing too. You know, I, some young guys they ask me like, "Well, they notice in my playing that it changed." Um. And I'm trying to tell them like what what you're hearing is the change of music or the diff change of styles of music. I can still play those play the same way I played 30, 40 years ago, but music is not that way anymore. True, true. You know, like when you listen to like some a group like the Mahavishnu, and and you hear the way they those guys played back then, and then you hear bands play now. Or you hear the difference the way Billy played now and the way Billy played back then. Well, don't get it mis don't get it misstrewed, you know, screwed where you think that Billy can't play that same way. He can. I've seen him do it. You know, but however, it's gotta be a situation, you know, such as a a, a feel or the music has to lend itself to go back to to that to, in order to get to draw that thing out of him. Right. Because I remember when I played with Schofield, uh, we played opposite of Billy Cobham's band a few nights. And uh, I, the first night we were in Italy. Uh, no, we were in Europe somewhere. And I I came to the stage and I saw this big drum kit set up. And I'm like, finally, they got me a drum kit to play. They didn't tell me Billy Cobham was going to be there. <laughs> but I'm like, finally, they got a drum kit for me to play, you know, finally. The rod symbol's on the wrong side, but, you know, we just switch it over. And I'm sitting there playing it, and some guy came out of the back. He goes like, man, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean what I'm doing? I'm, I'm warming up on the, on the kit, you know, that uh, they got for me. He says, what do you mean, your kit? That's that's not your kit. I'm like, I'm Dennis Chambers, you know, with Schofield. This is my kit. He says, no, no, this is Billy Cobham's kit. I'm like, are we on the wrong stage? He says, no, you, you guys are playing, but this is Billy. Billy's playing tonight with you guys. And I felt like the Mako man. I was like, you know. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> and then, you know, I they showed me my kit. My kit was covered up when I pulled it, pulled it, the uh, pulled the cover off. The heads was all pitted. It was a it was a slingland, uh, if I can recall, slingland uh chrome kit. And the heads were all pitted in and all. It was just, it was a mess. But I played it. And, you know, I wanted to, you know, I tried, I went out and played my best that night because, you know, I knew he was going to be watching. Yes. And I wanted to impress him. And <laughs> so after the show was over, I, you know, I got changed real quick, dried off, and I immediately went over to his dressing room. And um, his wife, said something I'm not going to repeat. And and he pointed to me, and, oh, yeah, that's him right there. And she came over, she, you know, introduced herself, and we talked, and, da, 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 and I'm sitting there watching him. I, all eyes on him, you know, because he's sitting there, you know, he did a few warm-ups that blew my mind. And uh, he came out and played, man, and you can tell the band didn't know he played like that. But what happened was, I think I inspired him to really go out and play. Uh-huh. <laughs> and when he played, man, it was like, uh, you could see the band members looking back, looking at him like, man, where did that come from? Like, Jesus Christ, what, you know? And he was going through it, man. I'm over there on the side of the stage with tears in my eyes, you know, because, you know, what I what I saw at that time, it was like it was like what I saw when he played with the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Right, right. Although the music was different, but his his vibe his 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 uh um uh, but yeah his vibe and 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 being pushed to play really play man he was killing yeah 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 and and you made a good point there because i mean we are who we are and we settled in on what's needed at the time in the context of win right 
Yeah. Can't lick me yet. No, no, you said it well. And if we have, there's a reason to do something else, then you 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 do, you go there. Otherwise, you don't. Yeah, you don't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, sense. I always tell people like it's true about what they say. It's like you you're just as good as the band that you play with at that moment. And at that moment, you know, you know, like when I played with with Schofield and John McLaughlin, well, the reason why I, I arrived at the occasion because the music lent itself for me to do that at that time. Now, in any other time, if you know you get hired to to play stuff that's um, that's not involved, too much involved, then you respond to that. You play, you know, I just play, I play what the music lend me to play, right. No, no, that's very well said. Yeah, and 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 of course, I have I have a question though. But how did the Santana thing come up? How did that happen? Did, did Carlos just invite you, or were you recommended? Well, let me, let me go back a little ways. I was I was supposed to play with Carlos in eighty. I think it was eighty six. Uh, I got a call from Bill Graham's office. You know, um, and I think at that time Chester Thompson, the drummer, was playing with him. And Chester's from Baltimore. Okay. And I knew yeah. Chester uh from way back when. Not with uh I didn't know him uh when he was here, when he lived here. I didn't know him. I knew of him, but I didn't really get the chance to meet him then. I met him when I joined P Funk. And um he recommended me for the gig with Santana. I got a call from Bill Graham's office. They hired me and fired me in the same week. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> that was your so, doing, right? <laughs> yeah. So they hired me, you know, hired me. And then um, what I was told was, uh, I think uh, Carlos had two weeks off and he didn't feel like rehearsing the band uh, in those two weeks. So he hired uh, um, Graham Lear back. Graham Lear, right. Yeah, he hired him back. So they had to fire me. So when I actually joined the band, okay, so now I'm with John Schofield. No, I'm with John McLaughlin. And we had opened for Carlos Santana. I think it was at Montreux. Yeah, in fact, it was Montreux. Um, Carlos heard me play. Um, when we got back to the hotel, we were all staying in the same hotel. When we got back to the hotel, I got a phone call um, from uh, Carlos's manager. And he, you know, asked me some questions. And he's, he said something about, you know, Carlos wanted me to come to his room. So I called up Joey DeFrancesco and we went up to the room and man, we hung out till like till it was time to go. I remember leaving Carlos's room and I, when I got to my room, I had enough time to open my suitcase and take my right arm and swept everything into the suitcase. Didn't have time to pack none of it, you know. You know, just brushed it all in and and check out and, and got to the to the to the bus on time. Actually, I think I was late getting to the bus. Um, in fact, yeah, I know I was late because Joey was late. I got there before Joey, you know. <laughs> um, right. And then uh, that night, or it was either that night or the next night, I get a phone call from my wife, and she says, uh, Carlos Santana's manager is looking for me. And I'm like, I thought it was like just a, it was just a miss cross because I was with Carlos the night that night before. So I asked, you know, when did he call? She said, when he called today. I'm like, that's weird. You know, I, I thought she was mistaken. Mm -hmm. And then if more phone calls came in. And then next thing I know, uh, Renee asked me, my wife, Renee, she she said uh, they wanted to get, a, he wanted to get get a hold of me and she gave him, gave him the number. So I get a phone call. It was a missed call. You know, I, we're playing phone tags for a minute and I finally got in contact with him. He says, hey, buddy, uh, you know, we need you to play the drums with, with Carlos. Uh, or how do you feel playing with Carlos in the band? I'm like, yeah, I would love to play with Carlos in the band. He says, well, good, we'll send you a plane ticket. I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? <laughs> but he wanted me to, to come immediately. Oh, I see. Wow. Okay. And I'm like, dude, I can't do that. I mean, because, you know, I'm on tour with McLaughlin. You know, that's my brother. I'm not going to just you know, abandon him and go play with, you know, some of the other band because they need me. Um, and he said he understood. And then he says, well, you know, maybe for, you know, somewhere down the line, you know, you know, we'll hook it up. I'm like, okay, whatever. Something in the gig is blown after that. 
Um, I think it was like a year later, I get a phone call from Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Chisholm. How you doing? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. And he's telling me what, what, talking to me about joining. Oh, actually, he's talking to me about recording a record with Carlos. And I'm like, yeah, sure, when? So we kind of sussed it out, you know, got the time right. And I flew out to California, what, to San Francisco, and I'm in the studio recording with him, um, you know, just talking to him and, you know, whichever have you. So I'm out on break on in between takes on one of the songs. He comes out, we're smoking cigars, and he was telling me it's going to be great next year because during the time we were we were recording that record, um, they were off for a whole year. They took off. Well, Carlos took off for a year. Okay. So he, the only thing he did was recorded that record and, and supposedly wait until the following year and he was going to tour again. So he's talking to me about, man, it's going to be great having you in the band, you know, just that you in the band. I'm sitting there looking at him like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> I didn't know I was in the band. He, <laughs> and then uh, I'm like, sure, I played along with it. And then Kevin, uh, when Carlos left, Kevin came out, his manager came uh, came out and was talking to me about, uh, it's going to be great to have you in the band, man. Carlos, you know, loved the way you play and he loves you and da 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 and, You know, like, uh, you're going to join. And I'm like, well, let me think about it for a minute because I, I was kind of confused. I came out there to, I came out to do a record. I didn't know I was in the band, you know, or whatever have you. And I thought about it. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I, I always wanted to play with Carlos. This would be great, you know. So I joined the band uh, from that point on. And you were there 12 years or something, right? Yeah, 12 years of that. 12 years of playing with Carlos. Yeah. Nice, nice. The, I mean, it's it's interesting how these things, uh, you know, these roads lead you to one thing or another. I mean, you never really stopped playing. I mean, except that time that you had uh, the incident in was it Spain or Japan? I, I yeah. forget. <clears throat> but I mean, you've been playing since day one, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I think the only time I had off is during the time I was sick and COVID. Those two years. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, I had the conversation with uh, Chester Thompson, and I remember he he said uh, we had this conversation about all the musicians in Baltimore because because uh, Chester came to Cosa a couple of times and I finally was able to have, we were able to have you out at the Cosa camp in Vermont. And, and that was amazing because, I mean, it was important for us to have like, you know, in that environment, people ha having access to, to all the players in that, in that kind of environment, you know, not just a school situation, not just a, a regular kind of camp, but a place where you had time to, to go beyond the classroom, and it was great. And yeah. Chester was mentioning how many great musicians were from Baltimore. Wow, yeah. amazing! You know, Bernard Purdy's from from Maryland. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you know what? Where I, I'm at, I'm at, I'm at one of those NAMM shows, and I'm standing there talking to Bernard. <laughs> we're talking, and he's like, "Yeah, tell me, tell me about the clubs in Baltimore." And I'm talking to him about. You know the the uh, Peyton play uh, the uh, yeah Peyton plays the 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 uh, the lyric, uh, you know all about Pennsylvania Avenue and he's sitting there looking at me and I'm like yeah you know talking about the closet, you know uh, there was another club we, we used to play, can't think of the name of it right now. He said yeah man I I remember that place yeah that that place is great you know this that da da da, and now he's telling me about some places in Baltimore and I'm like dude what do you know about Baltimore? And he looked at me. With the, that look of Bernard, you know, oh, yeah. he looked at me and go like, don't you know? I'm like, don't I know what? He says, fool, I'm from Maryland. And I laugh, looking at him. He's not laughing. He's just looking at me, stone, look, just look. <laughs> yes. I'm like, you're yeah. kidding. He says, no. I'm like, what part? He said, Elton, Maryland. Elton, Maryland is not that far from where I live. And uh, I didn't believe it. So I'm like, yeah, whatever. Dismissed it. Um, he was getting the key to Elton, Maryland, and invited me to come down. And I didn't I, I didn't believe it until I went there. And I, when I walked into the room, there he is behind a, uh, uh, behind a desk, and they were presenting him a key to Maryland. 
and I saw his family. They were showing films of like uh, or pictures of his house where he grew up, and all of that. Nice. I was. I mean, you could have you could have knocked me over with a feather. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. No, and there's some great thing. I saw a, a, a documentary of uh, Aretha when he was uh, playing. You know, one of those church things, and it'd be like, yeah. yeah, he was he was everywhere. Well, a lot of people don't know, um, you know, back in them days, man, over in Europe, he was he was a he was a huge star. You know, all the drummers copied him. In fact, uh, when he played with, uh, he did a recording with uh, Dee Dee Warwick, and the song is called "Foolish Fool." That was that's where the, they got the sound, or Led Zeppelin got their sound from listening to that record. If you go back and look at Dee Dee Warwick, "Foolish Fool." You can hear this big drum sound. John Bonham thought that the drummer that played on the record used a, a big bass drum, you know, big kit, but it wasn't. It was like a, you know, like a 22 by 14 kick drum, but it was recorded in a big room, okay. you know? And um, that was the start of their sound, including the guitar player. Now, I don't know who the guitar player that played on that record, Foolish Fool, but you can hear where, you can hear where Jimmy is trying to copy that, that whole thing. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I mean, Bernard Purdy, I mean, his sound is, is amazing. I, I took some lessons with him because I used to fly to New York every month to take lessons and stuff. And with Bernard, he would give me his lessons while just before doing a session. And, uh, and, and the lesson was in the drum booth as they're setting up. So we do the lesson and I'm playing and I'm saying, wow, these drums sound really awful. I hope they have time to tune them. And, you know, <laughs> as I'm, I'm thinking and I'm playing, you know, we're doing the, the lesson. I'm saying, wow, I can't believe how awful these things are. And then, you know, I was always invited to stay for the, for the session, which was brilliant, like a fly on the wall. So everybody's in, they start the recording and the drums sound like a million dollars. And he did nothing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's in your hands, right? Oh, yeah. That, it, yeah that, I, that, that taught me a huge lesson. And Bernard is amazing. I mean, of course. Yeah, but yeah. He, he's amazing. But a lot of people don't know this, the history of, of, of him. You know, some of those early recordings and, and uh, they don't know like this guy was like a, 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 a drum legend in, in, uh, in uh, Europe. Right. Okay. And um, who, who inspired you know people to do what they do, and, and uh, including with the Beatles, um, you know the sound of the drums, you know like with, when they started putting all like wallets and, and and putting towels over the over the over the drums, they were trying to get that sound that 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 Purdy had at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, Purdy used to play. A lot of people didn't know. They didn't know that Purdy used to play with uh, Jeff Beck, ah, and that's where Nada, uh, uh, Nada Michael Walden, was discovered by uh, um, Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck discovered Nada when they did a double bill with McLaughlin. Purdy was the drummer for Jeff Beck at the time. Okay, wow. and he was supposed to play on you know Blow by Blow and Wire and all that stuff. Yeah. But they, you know, they saw Michael and hired him. Yeah. Those are great albums, by the way. I mean, I, I was just playing them last week before I heard. And, it was, you know, the Wired album, especially, the, was John Martin produced that album, I think. Yeah. And amazing. I mean, I, I mean, the whole thing was amazing. But I didn't know Bernard was in on that, on that beginning. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. I got a picture somewhere uh, in one of my, one of my drives. I got pictures of you can see uh Bernard 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 playing with Jeff and you can see not on Michael Walden's kit or like right behind Bernard. And uh, yeah, and actually Michael was playing too on the on the photo that I have. In fact, they were both, yeah, because John McLaughlin and and Jeff was playing on, on the stage at the same time, and you can see two drummers back there playing. Ah. Wow. Yeah. Too much. Nice. And, and you're doing some work with uh, Mike Stern recently also. I mean, you've been working with him um, for a while, right? But you were doing something recently with him. Yeah, I just finished a new recording. I, 
play three songs on the new album. But the interesting thing is, and the great thing is, that um, Christian McBride and um, uh, uh, Sanchez. Antonio? Antonio Sanchez. Great drummer, man. He, he They're playing with him as well. So I can't wait to hear what they've done with, with some of Stern's music. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got home like two days ago uh, from, from New York doing that recording. Nice. Any, anything, um, Any? I mean, I know you've done videos and, and, you know, educational materials and all of that business and, and there's tons of recordings and you're like, you're, you're omnipresent, which is, which is fantastic. What, um, at this point in time, is there anything that you're working on that you're envisioning that you've always wanted to do and finally you're able to do it time-wise? No, no, I, uh, there's nothing I, um, uh, let me see. No, I mean, the, 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 the things I'm doing this year is, is a regurgitation of what I've done last year. You know, playing with Mike, playing with uh, Osnoy, and, and and I just did a new record, a live recording with Osnoy and Jimmy Haslip as well. Nice. That was recorded in uh, late December. In fact, it was on the 20, 29th and 30th. We did a recording, a live recording. Beautiful. Yeah. So it's, it's just the same thing I did last year. It's going to be doing this year. Um. I'm going to be doing some drum clinics uh, here and there. I think I got a drum clinic, and also I'm doing a performance um, um, with uh, a big band in New Zealand. Uh, Roger Fox, big band. Nice. I'll be nice. doing that, and uh, also doing some clinics and stuff while I'm there. Beautiful. But I have a, a another question. Actually, a final question. But um, if you were to give people advice. With all the history that you've had, uh, people moving forward um, in the music that that's, that's developing now in the music world as it as it's moving forward, what would you would, uh, give as advice to somebody who wants to uh, make music their living, drummer, percussion, or musical music musician in general? Uh, I, you know, I always say, you know, I always try to tell people, man, like no, no matter what, you should always try to study all styles of music you know i mean even if if you don't like it just still just learn or dissect what it is that you don't like so at least you know the reason why you don't like it other than i don't know what it is or when somebody asks you why do you don't like this well, i don't know man i just I, don't, I can't tell you i just don't like it um but if you study it then you may understand you know the reason why you, you don't like it or you may you may learn something from it where you go like oh man I was misled or I had the wrong idea about this this music you know but you know if you listen to all styles of music it make be it make you become a better musician you know if you learn especially if you if you're a funk guy you know you should learn how to play jazz and rock and soul and, and all that stuff well don't play. Yeah, I mean, you already know how to play soul if you play funk. But you know, learn how to learn how to play rock music. Learn how to play Latin music, man. I mean, Latin music still kills me when I when I hear that. Uh, you know, when I go hear a good Latin Latin band, I'm not a dancer, man, and it, it makes me want to move. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the fun that they're they're having on stage and and looking at the the look and feeling the vibe in the audience where people are just dancing their hearts out. You know. Um, yeah. and the band is I, the band, so just I'm mean, you know the rhythms, the band is just killing. Yeah. I went to uh, when I was in Brazil. I went to I got a chance, or I had a chance to go to a samba school, and I went there, and man, I never heard anything like that in my life. And seeing how people were, you know, dancing, uh, it was just unbelievable. Yep, really unbelievable. But yeah, you know, Latin music, I, I I really, really, you know, try to get in deep into now. You know, that's why I love people like uh, um, Horacio Hernandez and um, Enrique Black, you know. Oh, um, Enrique, I'm sure yes. I'm pronouncing that name yeah, right, but yeah. I love those guys, you know, Irikide, you know, and uh, all those kind of groups like that. 
Um, you remember when um, when we did the uh, the live from Havana, that two day intensive last yeah. year? <laughs> and it was it was funny because you and I were speaking, and I was telling you about it. And he says, oh, I'd love to be there. It, it was like live two day intensive, you know, during the whole COVID, everybody was in lockdown, including Cuba, no music in Cuba. So we organized this and Horacio was there and, you know, all the, all the guys like Piloto and, and Changuito and, and Oliver and all the guys. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So then I, I mentioned to you, I, I, you said, so, you know, you said, <laughs> say hello for me. And I said, wait a second, why don't you just be men and we'll surprise everybody. And you yeah. did. And you remember the face on Horacio when he saw you on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I, I, you know, it's those things that uh, just add the spark, you know, a little bit of joy to, to the moment. That was beautiful. And thanks for doing that, by the way. Uh, that was my pleasure. I, you know, when you told me, you know, that was that that can happen, I was like, man, I, def I definitely have to have to, I definitely have to do that. That dude, he's like a brother to me. He feels yeah. more like a brother to me than my own brother, you know. Yeah. And Chiquito, and every time I go, uh, or or the time I went, I should say, uh, you know, meaning he Chiquito came out. It was his birthday, and yet he's came out to spend time with me and brought me some cigars. You know, nice, nice. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe it. That you know, this guy, you know, shows up on his birthday, shows up to come to to say hello and 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 listen to me play. You know. Now, the band I was playing with, that's another situation. <laughs> but, man, he, you know, he he showed up. And A.K. Block was there. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they were just great people, man. Yeah. I really, and, really love Cuba. And I love those musicians down there. Oh, uh, and they're real. They're real. And, they, you know, it's, it's so nice. I've been going there for over 20 years doing the, the workshops that we do. Yeah. And finally, this year, we're starting up again. So... Uh, doing our Cosa one week in event, yeah, the, the workshop. So we're getting that going again. So I'm yeah. I'm really happy. That's that's great. Finally, you know, but the thing that gets me is like, you know, you you go to these schools where kids are just learning how to play the the you know the instrument, and they're blowing me away. There, there's something in the water down there. Or something. <laughs> that... Well, you know you know what it is. It's a on the streets. Everybody's is just all open. It's part of their daily lives. B, in the schools, and especially the conservatories in the schools, they start them really young. So the music programs, it's not like they have to fight to have music programs in the schools. They have to turn people away because everybody plays. And those serious people who want to become serious, they're totally trained. Classically, you know, they, they, yeah. they study classical and then they learn yeah. all their, their own music so by the time you hear them at 15, they could be touring the world, you know, and amazing. amazing. Exactly, because that's what I heard when I went down there. I, I, I'm looking at these guys and I'm, I'm checking out their age and I'm looking at them, especially, you know, like the, 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 the guys that play a melodic instrument and some of the guys that play, you know, percussion. I'm looking at them like, you know, I'm listening to what's going on and I I, I want to like pull them aside and like try to figure some things out, you know, get some lessons myself. And they're just learning. Right. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, we, we take we take groups down and we're we're going to be taking the next one, which is now we're restarting. We're taking a high school big band down. And I suggested to uh, to the organization, I said, why don't we invite some of the Cubans, a uh, trumpet player, a sax player, or, you know, a couple, two or three people to, to be guests. And so they were all over that. So we're going to be doing three concerts with yeah. them as guests. And then we're going to be doing at the em playing concert at the embassy. Uh, they're going to be performing public and having this interaction you know, sitting in it. So, you know, our, our kids can see what level they're at and maybe get more inspiration that way. Yeah. You know, I, I can't wait idea. to see their faces. That's a great idea.